Listen up. There's no more excuses. We're empowering those who want the hustle by exposing the status quo. The days of ordinary are over. It's time to crush mediocrity and start discovering your greatest potential. Welcome to the Hustle Nation. 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 Welcome back to another episode of the Hustle Nation podcast. Today, we've got a real treat, Kate Sasenko, all the way from London, England. She is founder of The Good Busy, where she gets helps people get good busy so you can make time for what matters most. I know that this is a topic that anybody in this planet would want to take advantage of. There are so many questions we have for you. Can't wait to get started. But first, thanks for joining us today, Kate. Thanks so much for having me, both of you. Thank you. My pleasure. First question I always like to ask our guests is, tell us a little bit about your journey and how you got here. I'm really curious about how someone wanted to get into this business of time and what that looks like now. Business of time. That's a, so I never thought I was in the business of time, but yeah, I, I might use that in the future. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> you know, I was playing sports. I was playing sports for 10 years when I was younger. And I think that that's how I sort of got into being busy as a, as a child overall. So I was constantly doing something. I was on the court or sort of doing the physio. And, you know, when I was 11 years old, I, I was in a tennis, professional tennis academy where I trained six hours a day. So I would um, wake up at seven, you know, have breakfast, go to, to the academy, start training, then get some rest, then in the afternoon, train again, then go to school and come back home at 10 p.m. So for a normal adult, that's, that's a very, very busy day, right? And nobody wants to have that day, but I had it as a child and I enjoyed it. I loved it. So I never thought of the word busy as something negative. And um, I think that it's only when I actually got into corporate. So in my 20s, I was extremely bad busy because I was trying to do everything um, and I was trying to fit everything in, which was now I understand it was impossible. And then later on, when I sort of explored this, this notion of time and productivity and how it works, I understood that productivity is not about achieving and succeeding in everything. It's about um, achieving and succeeding in what matters. And so I started being picky, right? I started saying no to things. I started to be very intentional what I say yes to. I asked much more questions than I did in my 20s. In my 20s, I used to talk. It's just, I do, I take, you know. And in my 30s, I was much more mindful of pausing and sort of asking a lot of questions before I talk. And that's that's how I got there. So I, I was in um, corporate for 15 years. Uh, my background is in client relationship management and client experience. I trained uh, salespeople and marketing people, so I loved training. And five years ago, a manager introduced me to coaching. And because coaching sounded familiar because of my sports background, but here I was sort of talking about executive coaching and I loved it. So I got a degree um, in coaching. I got an education, so I'm an accredited coach. And then I moved um, out of the, of the corporate world to start sort of my own journey. And I chose productivity because I, yeah, I'm sort of, you know, an organization freak. I love and I value time a lot um, as well. I also think that we sometimes over, we have this overly um, confidence that we have a lot of time, you know, ahead. And experiences in my life taught me that we don't, unfortunately. So I learned to value time much more than I value money. And that's what I think actually makes people productive when we, they start valuing time much more than they value money. So here I am. How many people, though, struggle putting a dollar amount on their hourly rate or their time, per se? Because not everybody charges per hour like some of us. How do you help people with that? Because I find that so many people don't understand what their actual time is worth. And some people look at that and they're like, what do you even mean? What is my time worth? That's just something coaches say. Yeah, that's a, actually, it's a very, very good question. So... I think that the reason people don't understand how much their time worth is because they don't see it. So more than 80% of our actions are driven by our eyes, by visual clues. And so that's why we value money more than time, because we can see money, we can touch money, and we get rewarded with money. 
So many people, if you look, I mean, they, they all have bank accounts, right? At the end of the month, they receive their bank statement. So they look how they spend their money. So immediately they say, oh, I shouldn't be spending on this. I shouldn't be doing this. Next time, you know, I should be more mindful with this. But we don't have this approach with time. So it's very hard for people to put sort of, you know, the price uh, on, on their time. And I think that when they get to the point where they know the price is where the, the questions will health kick in, you know? So they start, for example, feeling that, okay, something is wrong. We're getting close to the burnout or we're missing out the time with family. So that's where the real value in those questions start to pop up. But until we get there, we sort of don't know exactly how much our time is worth. And so Kate, you know, one of the things with time, even as people look at it, I feel like a lot of times people can't get out of the, you know, the hamster wheel, right? So they, they're running really fast and they feel like if they, if they slow down at all, they're not going to be able to accomplish what they're accomplishing. And they, they probably know they're, they are on the hamster wheel, but they yeah. just have no idea how to even just step out for a second to try to slow it down and, and to your point, focus on, on the right things. How, how do you see people kind of getting out of that hamster wheel and, and to just kind of take that second to reflect a little bit on what actually am I doing? Yeah, so, um, you know, when I was playing tennis, when you kind of are in the sports, every single time after the training or the match, my coach taught me to replay, so to reflect. What did I do well? What didn't I do well? And that became sort of a habit that I built since I was little. And I think that we don't do that enough. And that's why many people are on the hamster wheel because they continue doing things because they think, you know, I'm not productive, so I need to do more. But they continue doing more things that don't bring any results, don't bring any outcome. And that's why they continue to be on that uh, hamster wheel, right? So interestingly, when I was working in Thailand, I was working for one of the luxury resorts um, and the philosophy there was slow life. And that's exactly where I learned how to slow down. And I understood that productivity and Cal Newport talks a lot about it, it's slow productivity. So productivity is actually doing less. It's actually knowing what to stop doing and when to stop doing, because we can achieve better quality productivity is about quality is not about quantity so we when we learn and we focus on doing less things we actually deliver better quality so that's the 80 20 rule right and we actually have time to breathe and we have time to reflect we have time to replay so this is how i learned and it's interesting like when i was working in the resort i remember guests arriving to the resort and we would ask them to take off their shoes so that they can sort of, you know, be grounded. And then we asked them not to turn on the phone, at least for the time that they were in the resort. So the whole idea was just enjoy, you know, the reflection time, enjoy being here, enjoy being in the now, enjoy, you know, anything you want. The reason you came here is not to be on your phone. That was kind of the reminder as well. So this, this, this was really the philosophy that taught me a lot. And I think that one of the proudest projects in my life was done in that company. I achieved it. I, would, I never, I practically never worked overtime in that company. Never. But I, I achieved a, a lot. So, Kate, one of the things uh, what I'm hearing you say there is less is more. And I come from a marketing background where a lot of people try to fill up a web page with way too much text. And I, I've not only come to the conclusion for myself years ago, but I found it to be more impactful when you say less. Choose fewer words can make a bigger impact than trying to use more words, which oftentimes people say, I, well, I won't even bother reading that. So you can't, you don't have the opportunity to make effect and an impact, I should say. But do you believe that, that less is more? Is this something you help your clients with? 100%. We're doing too much, actually. Every time I realized it, that I was doing too much, it was every time I resigned. Because when you resign and you decide to leave, you stop doing many things that you were doing before, right? Because you're like, I'm not staying. I mean, this we need to be honest with ourselves. At least it happened to me every single time. So that's how I learned that 50% of the workload I was putting on myself. 
And that was not all valuable workload. That was a lot of work that was absolutely worthless. So one of Kate, uh, the pe people yeah, go wear ahead. Pe people wear this busy as a badge of honor. So they they often say, "Well, yeah, I'm doing more. I'm I'm busy. I'm busy. You know, I'm doing more." So not only is it maybe something in their their head, like a mentality saying, yeah, this is good, right? I'm busy, I'm always doing stuff, I'm working toward it. But probably half of what they're doing, as you say, may not be aligned with their goals and objectives. Yeah, because many people don't know their goals. Most of the time when I, are, when I work with people, they know exactly what's happening and what they don't want, what's happening right now. But when I ask them, so what do you want? That's where the big pause happens. Many people simply don't know what they want because it doesn't necessarily mean the opposite. So they've never paused to actually ask themselves one question. If I don't want this, what do I want and how do I get there? Right? So, and to your point, Chris, about being busy, I think there's a lot of, call it group thinking or bandwagon effect in, in corporate, right? Right. Athletes, I always give a lot of examples with sports because of my background in sports, but think of athletes, right? Aren't they busy? Why aren't they complaining about being busy? I mean, those, I can tell you, I train six hours a day. I can tell yeah. you that's being busy. You, you, I, and I don't know yeah. if you're going to, you know, enjoy a, a game with somebody who is texting at the same time, right? It wouldn't be the same game. But the fact is that the busy is not a bad word. It's because we made it busy. The difference between athletes being busy and between people in corporate being busy is that athletes are monotasking. They're focusing on one task. And we are in corporate, we're multitasking. And multitasking overwhelms us. So that's the huge difference. And because a lot of people were talking about busy being bad, especially on LinkedIn, where I'm very present, I went and researched it. Busy is not bad. It's just a simple word. Doctor is busy with a patient. It means that he's working, right? So that's it. That's all it means. Busy means dedicating full attention and full effort to one activity. It means not being able to take on something else because you're already doing something else. So it's a pure definition of monotasking. But because we made it, we turned it into multitasking to feel important, right? Or because of the misconception of productivity, because we need to do more. Now we are kind of paying, paying the price for it. But in reality, it's... It's not a badge of honor, but I must say that I, I absolutely agree that being busy doesn't mean to be doesn't mean being productive, but to be productive, you need to get busy. It's just the how that's different. Yeah, you bet. You know, you're, you said something there that I think is so critical: monotasking versus multitasking. I know one of the things we've talked about here is people talk about multitasking all the time. They're not actually multitasking; they're actually task jumping. <laughs> And, yeah. and so they end up never actually getting anywhere because it's, well, I'm going to spend three minutes here and three minutes here. And we know that the typical person is going to take you 17 minutes to basically get into the flow of something. Right. And so if you're task jumping, you're actually not doing anything. <laughs> you're just, you're going laterally mm -hmm. back and forth. And so to your point of the, you know, uh, the athletes monotasking, and that's really why to your point, you know, I, I guess I've never thought of it that way of how they don't complain about their being, them being busy. Yeah. yeah, they're, they're pretty busy. Yeah. <laughs> they're, you know, they're traveling, they're working out, they're eating perfect They're I mean, they're doing a lot of things uh, to, to be busy. I think, I think that's a really good distinction. Yeah, it's, I think so, it's the same, okay, just think things... about, yeah, sorry, just wanted to add on the same on yeah. musicians, actors, you know, everybody thrives on being busy. It's just the corporate world that sort of is not embracing it somehow. This really aligns well with something Dustin and I talk a lot about having a business and a podcast that has the word hustle in it. You'd think that for many people that that's a good thing, right? Hustle being productivity, being uh, something that you coach and teach youth in sports today um, to get to a level of success. However, hustle carries a negative connotation in several categories and in several parts of the world. And so when we talk about hustle, people say, well, you know, what you're suggesting is working 60 hours a week and that creates burnout. And a lot of people who are hustling aren't eating well. They're not taking care of themselves. They're not maybe being present with their family or their spouses, people in their life. And so it's, it's very interesting to me 
that hustle carries these negative connotations where at the end of the day, part of what we're trying to do is similar to what you're trying to do is really just enhance productivity. I, I, we don't necessarily believe you need to work 60 hours a week. We just believe that you need to enhance your productivity by focusing on the things that are most aligned with your goals and objectives, the, the things that are going to get you from point A to point B, B to C, et cetera, et cetera. Um, do you find that w- when you talk about busy, that it carries some negative connotations as well? All the time. So even my favorite books of all time say, you know, stop saying about being good busy. <laughs> and here I am, you know, <laughs> talking about being good busy every single day. But the fact is we are, we are busy is not a bad word. It's, it's, we made it into a bad word, but it's, it's absolutely not. It's very simple. Just go look in the synonyms, right? Busy means, for example, one of the synonym is being diligent and diligence is not a bad word, right? Um, so I think it's really, people don't ask enough questions in this world, right? We, we, we think busy is bad because somebody else said it. And so we just pick up on it and we just say, okay, I'm busy, but it's, 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 it's horrible. I have a story when I was not busy at work and I can tell you that it's a million times worse than not being, I mean, than being busy because there is nothing you can do. The time is just completely wasted and you literally, the minute you're bored and not busy at work, you lose all the self-worth because you don't understand what you're doing here. You don't understand what you're doing with your life. And think for a moment of Maslow pyramid, right? So the top of the pyramid is the self-actualization rate. Self-actualization, it means that I am bringing value to somebody. The only way to bring value to someone is to work, is to produce that value. And to produce that value, you need to get busy. So whether you like work or not, it's better you start liking it if you want to get to the top of that pyramid and be a happy person. It's as simple as that. That's, that's excellent. You know, I think it's interesting your your reference to sports that you know we we talk we reference sports all the time here and as you're just talking one of the things that you know just kind of hit me that, that kind of ties to some of the things we've talked about is kind of the vision right so when you talk about like corporate america you're just task jumping right and and people get frustrated and burnt out and things like that you know versus you know in sports it's so clear what you need to spend time on and they, and, and athletes invest in coaches and training and outside sources. And, but, but even with all of those things, they are so laser focused on what, what is going to help them in their outcome versus I feel like sometimes in actually a lot of times in business. uh, And then even sometimes for people individually, if they're not athletes, they have no vision of their own lives. Right. So, you know, one of the things I, I share with, you know, a lot of people, you know, my, to me, my vision is pretty clear. I want to be husband, father, business leader, community leader in that order, right? And that sounds really basic, but I think there's a lot of people that don't even think through that, that very basic lens of what, what actually is important to you. Now, there's probably people in a day that may say, well, it seems like other things take priorities over you know, being a husband and father at times. And well, yes, part of being a husband and father, there's also sacrifice that I have to do to provide and things like that. But if I was a terrible husband, an absent father, right? Well, then everything else I did wouldn't matter either. And, you know, everyone's kind of balance and within that might be different. But I feel like, you know, just as you're talking, I think that's one of the beauties of, of the athletes is they have such clear vision as to exactly what they're trying to accomplish and exactly how they're going to get there. I agree. And I think um, the difference is because they always have one goal is to win. And the goal is very clear. And what happens in business, and this is also an example that I give a lot to people, is that in business, we confuse KPIs with goals. And the reason why people hassle, sorry if I use the word, I know it's not the, but they hustle in a yeah. bad way in yeah. corporate is because yeah. they are going after the KPIs and they are not going after the goal. So when they get to the KPIs, they see that they haven't reached the goal. And so they get very disappointed right? Mm. Demotivates it. But it's because nobody yeah. explains. And look at the, I mean, I, I worked once where I received a, a dashboard for general managers with 35 KPIs and I was asked to add three more. And I said, wow, <laughs> what are they going to focus on? I and mean, good luck. Um, 
I was, you know, thankful I was not the general manager at the time, but this is the difference. Sports, they have very, very clear goal. It's there, right? Whether it's football, basketball, they know it. We've got to win. That's all we have to do. They don't look at the KPIs. I always give example of tennis because I played tennis. So, um, you know, at the end, whether you win 6-0, 6-0 or 7-6, 6-7, 7-6, you won. That's the outcome, right? And the percentage of your serve, for example, is one of the tennis KPIs, but it doesn't matter. All that matters is the outcome. So if you take Nadal, Djokovic, Federer, they don't care if they, you know, sort of achieved 100% of first serve, but they lost, (laughs) right? Mm -hmm. But somehow in corporate, we, we confuse the two. And that's why when you look yeah. at the performance reviews, very often these are not goals. Very often these are KPIs. Yes. But to me, that's KPIs, excellent. I never understood why KPIs are key performance indicators. What, what, what performance do they indicate? For me, they are key pathways, right, indicators. So they can show yeah. me whether I go this way or that way. And if I go that way, that will happen. But they don't tell me anything about my performance. So... I don't know who invented that, but I sort of not not sure <laughs> about it. That's that's a brilliant distinction because you know we see it uh, in our business as well, right? Like, I mean, it's funny you say that because now I'm thinking about our our own organization and and we certainly track goals and KPIs and and you know to your point, we we instinctively know it, right? Like, there's plenty of you can hit a KPI and not hit your goal. Yeah, of and, course. And uh, I. I I like your distinction about pathways uh, versus performance. Cause you know, to your point, obviously if, if uh, your serve percentage, right. If, if it's, if it's low, that might impact your ability to win. But at the end of the day, it's about winning or losing. Exactly. <laughs> and, I, I, and so it, may, it might be a pathway to get, to increase your chances of winning. But at the end of the day, there's lots of different ways to win. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's also because in sports, um, Athletes are more honest with themselves, right? There is nobody to blame. As, especially, I mean, I don't believe in individual sports because there is no such thing. Even tennis for me is not an individual sports, but still yeah. there is nothing, nobody else to blame, right? It's all on them. And in mm-hmm. corporate, it's very easy to point a finger at, at somebody else, right? So we mm-hmm. kind of, um, there is this self-serving bias that we are prone to in corporate, you know, when these are successes, successes on my own and failures. Well, it's somebody else, right? When people talk about companies, they often say companies, but companies do not exist without um, people. <laughs> so, right. So maybe if we just stop talking about companies in the third person and we start saying, we will get a little bit more accountable for what is happening in the company. And I'm not saying that you can, and you're responsible for everything and you can change everything. Absolutely not. But I believe in 80, 20, and Brian Tracy says that, you know, Pareto rule, whatever, 80% is internal. So it's all in us. It's, it's really about our own decisions. Meetings do not happen on their own. Emails do not send on their own. So we need to be a little bit more honest, uh, you know, with ourselves. And when it comes to goals, it's the same. A lot of people confuse also goals with purposes. Purpose is not the same as a goal. You need to be very clear and realistic. The goals of most of the companies is to make money. Right, <laughs> because even if you achieve your, I mean, the idea is that you make your, you make money to achieve the purpose, right? But the fact is, the goal is one. <laughs> so we kind of are ashamed to say this, but it people don't, you know, start companies. You know, it's it's either an own profit, okay, fine, but if it's a company, it's a company. You're here to, you know, generate sales and create revenue, um, profit. That's it. So as soon as you start understanding this, you know that your goal needs to be to contribute to this. So if your sort of performance review, you see that it, it's, you're not contributing to this, so you're not, you, you don't have a goal. So Kate, all of this is music to my ears. And I think <laughs> about running a, a large company and I, I can't help but think and feel that other people within the company would love to have a culture uh, like this and would love to have leaders who think like this and tell their employees, yeah, we want you to be good busy. We don't want you to just be bad busy. How do you help your leaders, your CEOs, your executives uh, it really implement some of these ideologies that you're coaching? 
I think um, many leaders today were absolutely not prepared to lead, me including. I've, before becoming a manager, I never received a training. It's sort of assumed people get promoted a lot because they achieve their objectives, their goals, or because they've been in the company for a very long time. Well, it's time to promote them because they're also sort of waiting for mm -hmm. it. But it also happened to me that people didn't want to be managers, but they were promoted. And so that they take it because, you know, of the reward. So we need to start this conversation with people before we offer this responsibility, because it is a responsibility. It is a reward, but it comes with an additional responsibility. And we need to prepare people ahead. Back to the to sports. No team allows, you know, an athlete to go play without being prepared without explaining the rules of the game, right? Without a proper training. But somehow in corporate, we take that person and we throw them into the field and say, good luck, right? Lead us to success. So we need to invest in that preparation. And I think that a lot of, uh, once again, we don't ask enough questions because we are scared. We are scared to admit, you know, we don't have certain skills, right? Because immediately that is seen like weakness and potentially then, you know, I won't be promoted again. So, but the fact is we're not doing ourselves a favor again. So this is something that I've just understood about six, seven years ago. I was actually blaming my company at that time for not offering me growth opportunities. And then I understood that it's not about the company. I needed to ask for my own growth opportunities. So what I've done, I sort of went to my company and I said, this is exactly what I want to learn. And this is how it's going to benefit the company. But if we don't ask, we are not going to get. So, yeah, for me, preparation is key. They say 80%, 75%, whatever number you believe in. But the fact is that you, sorry, but the fact is that you need to really believe and invest in preparation. And we don't, don't do that enough. Yeah, both in ourselves and in our fellow team members. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. It's the same as, you know, so, your... so Kate. Yeah, go ahead. So Kate, one of the questions I had, so one of the roles you had uh, was really in client experience. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things when I think of like prioritization, so we're in a, we're in a service business ourselves and, you know, we have, you know, we, we refer to, you know, the client first mentality, right? You know, what, whatever we need to do to, to you know make the client happy and successful and how can we support them best but you know when, when we when we talk about prioritization and productivity there's a balance there right because uh, a lot of times you know if you're interacting with a customer that might ask for lots of different things and the helper in us just wants to do those things when in reality maybe the best thing we can do is not do some of those things and and refocus uh, the customer. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious in your, you know, being in a role of client experience, right. Where you're trying to elevate that client experience and, and kind of, how did you balance that with, you know, productivity and prioritization and, and good busy? Um, questions. So we need, we don't ask enough questions. A lot of times when clients or whoever, even our colleagues ask us to do things, we take and we do, we don't ask What's the outcome? What is the reason you're asking? You know, who is this for? We, we simply do not ask enough questions. So when you start asking questions, very often a lot of, ta a lot of tasks, they become unnecessary because you understand that you've answered it in the past or you already have the answer and you can send it into seconds. So the interesting stat is that uh, we are all born curious and kids ask four times more questions than adults. So in a normal conversation, kids have about 80% of um, questions and adults less than 25. Wow. And it's not that because they know less, it's because they simply want to, to know, but we don't want to know somehow. We lose that, you know. So we are curious about many other things, but somehow when it, the things are happening in the moment, we, we, we lose that curiosity. So the more questions we ask, the better busy we are. And I think Kate, that's what, the hamster wheel, right? Like I, I think yeah. few, people don't ask questions because they feel they don't even have time to ask the question. Just, yeah. you know, I, I hear it, I hear it uh, consistently in, in lots of businesses. 
I mean, I probably should have asked the question up front, but we just got to get it done. <laughs> it's like when you when you say that out loud, it just seems so obvious. But it, you know, I think that's where people's minds get shifted. But I think there's one other part with questions that that's challenging is there's always going to be a small population of people that are intimidated or afraid to ask the question because it could make them appear as though they're weak or they don't know or they should know, but they don't know. And then how is this going to make me look or feel in front of other people if I ask these questions? Because shouldn't I already know? I shouldn't have to ask these things. So how do you get past that? Because I have to imagine 20, 25% of the workforce is a little bit afraid to ask some questions. Yeah. Th so I think there is a responsibility obviously on, on the manager here, but there is a, a, a tip that I, a, that I can offer as well. So in terms of the responsibility on the manager, we talk a lot about psychological safety, right? But I think like purpose, psychological safety, we make it big immediately. And we try to sort of make something impossible and, you know, something that stands out. But for me, everything starts very, very small. So just think about familiarity, right? People feel safe with things that are, they are, that are familiar. So if manager created that familiarity by asking questions to them, to the team about them, and so they created that bond, no matter whether you're introvert, extrovert, whether you're afraid or not, you will, you'll feel comfortable asking questions because you have that familiarity, you have that base. So you can just simply start small. And then the tip that I um, started using as well myself, that's after I started uh, my coaching training, it's start the question with out of curiosity. So that make, doesn't make you sort of, you're not afraid that, oh, I'm weak or anything. It's just, I'm curious. I'm just naturally curious and curiosity is a positive um, quality, mm -hmm. right? So just out of curiosity, can I ask, you know, so, yeah. That's excellent. So as you think of through the lens of our listeners, you know, some of them might be in all different spectrums of, of good, busy and productivity and, you know, burnout and things like that. If there's one thing that they could, they could take away one, one change they could start tomorrow to just get them to refocus a little bit on what's, what is the most important thing? How would you coach them to do that? I think always start with the end in mind. I think this is the number one thing for anything. So a lot of people think of goals as something big or something that you mentioned earlier, vision, right? But goals can be very, very small that can be micro goals. So for example, I am talking to you today, so what's my goal, right? I need to know what's the outcome for me. You obviously have yours, but I need to know what's the outcome for me. So the same. So whenever people start questioning themselves for every single task, what's the goal? They'll get there much, much faster because they know exactly where to go. They have that destination. When you don't have the destination, that's where the time extends because you don't know where you need to get. And you, even if you got there, you just simply don't know that you got there because you just, you just don't know what success looks like, right? So. Okay, and I want to shift gears a little bit. You have these really awesome, good, busy playbooks on your website, which, by the way, listeners should go check out. You have one that really initially resonates with me. It's 33 Thinking Biases. And why it resonates with me is because Dustin and I are really big on mindset. And we talk to a lot of people about that. And I find so often that the cultures that maybe aren't where they need to be or the productive uh, employees or productivity in a workforce is not where it needs to be. A lot of it, you can distill it down to one thing and it's a mindset. And it, sometimes it's negativity, sometimes it's other things. But can you talk a little bit about those thinking biases? Because I just feel that is so directly related to mindset. Oh, I love that question. <laughs> Thank you so, so much for asking this one. This is probably my favorite question of the, of, you know, until now. So um, I believe productivity is, is an inner game. It's not an outer game. And I'm not, it's, these are not my words. These are words of um, Timothy Galway, who wrote the book, The Inner Game of Tennis. So a lot of times we think that we need systems and tools to fix productivity. But in reality, productivity is the outcome of our decisions. So everything happens in the mind, right? So earlier I mentioned about self-serving bias. That's the number one bias we have. And that's why I mentioned also the quote from Brian Tracy, 80% is internal, whereas 
you know, 20% as external. So if you play the outer game, you're focusing on those 20%. And it's very hard to change other people and systems and everything, right? But it's, you know, if you focus on the internal game, there's so much that is within your power and that you can change. So for me, self-serving bias, or there, there are so many of them, for example, you know, the hedonic trade mill is something that you mentioned earlier. It's related to the hamster wheel, right? People are just, they don't have goals. So they are just going around. And even if they got there, they simply don't know. They can't recognize that because they don't know how success looks like. So for me now currently, and I'm going to... Um, uh, announce the date of my course that I'm launching later this month, next week. But my co- my course is not about systems. It's not about apps and sort of blueprints. It's all about biases. It's really all about how we think. Because the, the moment we understand our own thinking patterns, we can change them. It's very hard to sort of wear complicated, you know, algorithms. So, um, but... We, we can, there are things that we can work with, right? So it's, it's all about understanding how we work and um, sort of recognizing those patterns in ourselves first and then in others so that we can take better decisions and then we can enjoy um, better outcomes. So definitely mindset is, for me, mindset and productivity, they're linked. I couldn't agree more. Excellent. Kate, okay, you've got another one on how to win the email game. And I've been doing this a little bit myself. I don't know if my process is the same as yours, but once a week, worst case scenario, every other week, I try to go through and clean out my inboxes because when I start my, a new week, which let's call it Monday morning, I can sit down at my desk and I don't feel this burden, this anxiety on my shoulders where it's like, oh my gosh, I have all these emails from Friday. I have all these others buried that I probably missed a couple of things. So I like to declutter because I know the first thing I can do is I can jump into a project and I just have this more feeling of jubilation rather than this feeling of, oh boy, this is going to take a lot of work. It's Monday again, which part of that's mindset, right? But I can prevent that mindset from ever creeping in because I'm more on top of my email game. Not always but that helps me to be more productive. Tell me more about this, how to win the email game. Yeah, so I think a lot of people think that winning the email game means to get your inbox to zero. I don't believe in that. (laughs) Email will will keep on coming. That's just a fact, accept it, right? That's, That's just what it is. But I think initially in the workplace, um, once again, we lack training because there is no communication system in the workplace. And I think it's very hard um, to develop one for the entire organization, especially if it's big, but you can develop at least one for your team. And so in many companies, um, I call them ping pong games, you know, email ping pong games. Again, <laughs> a little bit of analogy from, from uh, sports. But a lot of people just talk using emails to just ask one question at a time, and stuff. And this game, I had a I had a manager like this, and it's can be 25 emails, you know, with me in copy, my team talking to my manager. It is I it drew me crazy, honestly. So I would just text my team, like, could you call? Just give her a call, right? Um, I mean, the fact is that we need a system. So email is just a natural way for us to work, right? To communicate at work. But if it's important and urgent and it's in the moment, then it's a call. Or a WhatsApp message. I don't. With my team, we'll use a lot of WhatsApp or a DM, whatever system you use, right? But it can be an email. So for me, that's sort of the number one thing. Just create a design a system here, right? Because also understanding coming from uh, what you mentioned earlier, Chris, it brings you anxiety to see sort of the flood of emails, right? So it's because more is less. So <laughs> there is the anxiety that is creeping. So how to reduce that? First of all, create the system. The second thing that a lot of people do is thank you emails. One word, thank you emails. But you already said thank you before. There's no need to say thank you every single time. We know we are very polite people, right? But if you look at the number of thank you emails that you have, you'll probably clean a lot of emails from your from your inbox. And the third one, I don't know if it's work related, but I find now especially that I talk a lot of to a lot of entrepreneurs and stuff, 
these are um, sort of commercial emails. I don't know you, but I worked in CRM, so I don't give my email to any company <laughs> because I know exactly what they do with it. So I don't subscribe to newsletters. I have fair, because now I'm on LinkedIn, so there are a few newsletters that I love reading. I am subscribed to those, but all the rest, it's out. And I constantly unsubscribe. So I don't know if that's the cleaning that you meant as well, but this is a lot of, oh, you yeah. know, yeah, a lot of people get in a, and you know, I have, I love my sister, for example, but we are two different individuals here. My emails now are, you know, to z practically zero. My sisters are like 2000 something. Every time I look at her phone, just, uh, yeah. So. Yeah, I, I love everything you said there. I think that's phenomenal. And there there are some really phenomenal leaders who are productive, but they're maybe one or two steps away from being where they want to be. And that could be the one thing that helps propel them to get that to that next level of joy. And I, I think that's phenomenal. Um, Kate, last question as we wrap this up. What is one thing you would recommend everybody go do? We've got a lot of leaders who listen to the show. And what's one piece of advice you just say, this is what you should do? Coaching. A lot of people think that coaching is, uh, coaches fix you. Coaches do not fix you. Coaches are your thinking partners. And I think that I, I've done executive coaching in my life. I do peer coaching as well. I've done other types of coaching. I've done sports coaching. Coaches have this incredible ways of, you know, they are just, they are like friends, but better. Because they don't sugarcoat. They tell you things as they are, right? And they give you perspective that probably your friends are not able to, to give you because they, they know you from, from a different angle, right? Um, so for me, executive coaching literally changed my life. So I'm not saying that, you know, not everybody can pay an executive coach, but there are plenty of opportunities today. There are a lot of coaches that are looking for practice as well so you can get sort of even free coaching as well but i think this is an incredible way to work on your own mindset as you mentioned earlier mindset is very important and build new skills one of the skills is asking questions because you'll see how the coach is asking questions second how the coach listens and you'll learn listening and we know that's very important and thirdly you will make better decisions so coaching is definitely the number one advice i would give to everyone I love that because even if you are a leader, you're coaching your teammates, you're coaching the people who work for you, the people that work with you and thinking partner that I love that. I've never heard that before. And that, that should be what a coach is rather than someone telling you what to do and how to do it. They're thinking with you, problem solving with you. Phenomenal. Yeah. That's okay. my mentor's Before words. we let you okay. go. <laughs> yeah. I love that. <laughs> Before we let you go, tell everybody what you've got going on and where they can find you. Um, so everybody can find me on LinkedIn. So this is where I spend most of my time today. So every, almost every day I post um, around 1 p.m., uh, what, 1 p.m. London time. And um, I have my website, thegoodbusy.com. Um, so you can sign up for my newsletter and get five free playbooks right away. And currently I'm working on my course, The Good Busy Course for Leaders. It will be focused mostly on the mindset. Um, so how to ask questions and how to take better decisions. And that will be coming out soon. So I'm, I'm announcing the date next week on LinkedIn. So, Excellent. Well, Excellent. folks, you heard it. That, that was phenomenal. Um, go out there, check out these playbooks. I think, Kate, you've already added so much value to my day. And being that we're both big on mindset, it, it's a really nice to have a conversation with someone that has a slightly different perspective, but definitely aligns with it. And so many great nuggets. Um, I want to go check out the the tennis book as well that you mentioned, The Inner Game, because I've got a similar book myself, but it's about golf. So thank you so much for your time. Really enjoyed it today. For all the listeners out there, we appreciate your ears, the downloads. Until next time, peace. Thank you for being part of the Hustle Nation. If you're serious about raising the bar in your personal and professional life and willing to go all in on your success, head over to hustleleaders.com. 
Here you can get access to our Hustle Productivity ebook, attend our Hustle Masterclass, or challenge yourself to the 30 day Hustle Challenge. Pairing these tools and training with the Hustle Nation podcast will help you advance to a whole new level. Until next time, stay hungry and inspire those around you to hustle.